Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to start with the official podcast intro now, um, which will be, be will record and you'll be able to hear. Um, my glasses are so dirty. You'll be able to hear when you listen to next question wherever you get your podcast. So with that, let's begin. Welcome everyone to this live taping of Next Question with me, Katie Couric. I am delighted to bring you this conversation on the cost of caregiving in partnership with my friends at Capital One here at the Capital One Cafe at Herald Square in New York City. I'll be introducing you to the panel in just a moment, but a first a bit of why we're actually here tonight. Roughly 10,000 baby boomers will turn 65 every day for the next decade or so, and are likely to enjoy longer lives, living to 80, 90, even beyond, fingers crossed. That's a lot of retirement years, and unfortunately, not all of those years are lived independently. With in-home and assisted living care costs skyrocketing, taking care of aging relatives is falling more and more to their own loved ones. It's not easy. In fact, it can be overwhelming. So we're going to talk about how you can actually be prepared, whether you're a caregiver or you're the person being cared for. We're also going to talk about the unexpected joy and meaning these situations can actually bring about. So tonight, our guests are Celia Edwards Karam. She is the president of Retail Banking at Capital One, she has championed a people-first approach to banking to act as a partner to customers, whatever stage of life they happen to be in. Adrian Glussman is host of the Young Life Interrupted podcast. It's a weekly dose of community where guests and hosts share personal stories, insights, and conversations with other caregivers. And finally, Chris Pusali has built quite the community via social media. He's very active on TikTok where his videos about caring for his grandmother go out to not only 2.4 million subscribers, but get millions of views. And I'm very jealous of that, Chris. But um, <laughs> let, let's begin the conversation with the financial challenges, Celia, of being a caregiver. So I know this situation is affecting more people than ever. Can you kick things off by outlining the role you see caregiving playing in people's financial lives? I love this question. And caregiving is such a broad topic. We're going to mostly talk today about caregiving for the elderly, people who we helped raise us, maybe, who we are now going back to help take care of them. We also, though, sometimes think about caregiving in the context of kids. And one of the things we're seeing in our customers and really learning about from people is this notion of the sandwich generation, people who find themselves giving care to elder parents and giving care to kids and all of the, just the overwhelm that can come with a situation like that. I think from a financial perspective, caring for the elderly is probably something that many of us will have to contend with. And so in that same way that we might plan for retirement or we might plan for a child to be able to go to college, we might save for those things, saving for what it might mean to have to care for someone uh, is something that I think is a you know part of prudent financial well-being and financial health. How do you do that though? How do you you know what are the 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 actual practical steps, Celia? People can take when when talking about the future and being in either a caregiving role or being cared for. Well, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how Capital One helps with this, but I actually think lots of people across the like banking industry are really thinking about how do we help meet customers where they are and help with this caregiving need. Here at Capital One, one of the things we focus on is a program called Money in Life. And really the purpose of Money in Life is to have a conversation with you to understand what your goals are, what's going on in your family, what do you think might be going on 10, 20, 30 years down the road, and how do you start to build a plan for yourself? It's not about your advisor telling you what to do. It's about that person meeting you where you are and helping you develop a set of goals and a plan to then work towards those goals in the same way that you might work against any other goal, but really having that sort of shepherd and advice to help you get structured. And really kind of motivate you because I imagine a lot of people really feel uncomfortable having this conversation. Like, honey, 
girls, my daughters, when I'm old and incapacitated, I'd really like this and that. I mean, it's really kind of an awkward, it's kind of depressing, and people just don't really want to bring those things up. And they really need to. Are there ways that you can cut conversation starters or things people can do to make it, to, to break the ice, sort of? Yeah, it's, um, it's funny. Everything about money can be a little bit anxiety producing. And you add to it this notion of forecasting to some time in the future where you might not be as healthy as you want to be. Um, I think two of the things that we've seen work and, and that I've really learned from this kind of money and life coaching program are around you know opening those conversations with your kids or your niece or nephew, whoever it is in your family that is the right person to have that conversation with an honest, let's talk about the future. And what do you want for the future and what do I want? And making that sort of more of a conversation um, it might be a little bit of a hard topic, but there's no substitute for wading into it. We want to talk to our caregivers in a moment, but do you find that a lot of companies, it seems to me this issue has really been brought to the forefront. We've been talking, hearing about the sandwich generation for a while, but I think as we talked about, more and more people are finding themselves in this situation. Do you think co other companies, including Capital One, are embracing this issue? Are thinking about it in terms of helping their employees in general. And just as somebody who's in the industry, what are you seeing not only in banking, but in different companies? Yeah. It, Especially because the population is aging, right? It, in total, right? Yeah. This is something that I think you said at the beginning that everyone's going to have to contend with at some point or another. In our associate group, we have what we call affinity groups that we set up for different groups of associates to come together on a topic. Uh, in 2020 or maybe 2021, we launched something called And Family at Capital One, which is really about supporting associates who are going through the caregiving moment. And whether that caregiving is for... Uh, you know, someone who is, is aging or someone who is sick, or if it's for children, whatever the nature of caregiving happens to be, actually just finding a group where you can have like-minded conversation about how hard this is, about you know, feeling exhausted, sometimes about feeling guilty for feeling exhausted, right? There's a lot of complex emotion and just knowing that you're not in it alone um, has been a really important part for our associates to come together in that way and then to feel supported by a company who gives them space to, to give that connection and, and, and really start to find a place for themselves in the company. Adrian, I know you started caring for your mom, Hetty, when you were just 29 years old. Can you describe what was happening in your world and why you found yourself in this position? So my world was here in New York City. Uh, my mom, I'm originally from Florida, so my mom was all the way in Florida. And I was 29, I always like to say I was living like the sex in the city, you know, dreams, a single girl in the city. Trying Who are to you, Carrie Miranda or I Samantha? Won't, I won't say, I won't say. <laughs> Samantha. <laughs> but, um, you know, I was single and I was trying to figure out my career path and just having a great time with my friends. So those years are kind of selfish. So I was being very selfish in everything I was doing. Now, I'm the, an only child of divorced parents, and my mom and I are very close. So I always knew that I was going to have to care for her one day. But in my mind, it wasn't going to happen for another 30 years when I was probably married and had children and was very established and had already hit all of those milestones. So my mom was diagnosed with multiple system atrophy, which is a neurodegenerative rare disease. And at first, seemingly, it seemed like everything was okay. I was able to manage her care from a distance. But then when I was flying home to visit, I was starting to notice that things were off. And I said, okay, I'm going to have to start stepping in a little bit more. There were times I was up here, and I had to fly home at the drop of a hat, book a one-way ticket, because my mom was in the hospital, and there was nobody to be with her, and I wasn't going to leave her alone in the hospital. I needed to advocate for her. So as her disease started to progress, I finally decided this long distance caregiving, it's just way too tough. The anxiety that I was going through every single day, if she wouldn't pick up the phone, not knowing what was going on, trying to have a life up here, balance this whole other hidden life because it wasn't something, I say hidden because I didn't talk about it. I didn't talk about to my friends everything I was doing with my mom because 
they wouldn't understand. Nobody had gone through this before. So I finally made the decision in 2015 that I needed to move back home because it was too much to care for her at a distance. And moved back home, which provided a whole nother facet of caregiving, even though I wasn't long distance, being right there has its own set of challenges. And really, it turned my world upside down. I never in a million years thought I was going to move back to Florida, uh, where I was born and raised. I thought I would live in New York forever or go live abroad. I'm such a free spirit. I kind of went where the wind would take me. But here I was back in this role to care for my mom. And as hard as it was for me to leave New York City and give up this amazing city, this life that I had built for myself, all of my friends, I had just got offered my dream job working in travel <laughs> PR, and I had to just give it all up and make the decision to move back because I knew that just like my mom had cared for me my entire life and was an incredible mom, that it was my turn to care for her. It just came way too soon. Before we talk about how you all have shared your experiences, Chris, tell me how you wound up in your situation. Yeah, so about eight years ago, my grandmother, my grandmother was no longer able to get out of bed. It was just like a all of a sudden woke up, couldn't move anymore kind of thing. You know, my family and I had to have a conversation about whether we were going to take my grandmother to a facility or would we hire a full-time caregiver to stay at the house and be with her 24-7. And I was just about to graduate college. I had one semester left. I didn't have any job opportunities lined up. So I said, you know, my grandmother took care of me when I was young. So it only makes sense for me to step up and, and be responsible. So we, I decided to be our caregiver, uh, full-time caregiver. And, you know, we did that for eight years. And in the last three to four years of her life, I decided to document my life on the Internet and show people what it's like to be a young caregiver. And a lot of people gravitated towards it. I got messages from millions of other young caregivers out there saying that they see their grandmother or their grandfather through my grandmother. And uh, it's been a life changing experience. It's, it's really nice to know that you're not alone in this really uh, tough and uh, isolating experience. Um, you know, if you didn't have the Internet, then you think you'd be, you're the only one on, on the planet taking care of, you know, an elder. So. Uh, it's been a life-changing experience, and unfortunately, my grandmother passed away a couple weeks ago. And um, it's been tough, but it's been also relieving knowing that my grandmother lived till 97. Wow. Um, you know, she lived a great life, and I, and I can confidently say that the last eight years of her life, I don't, I mean, I wouldn't say they're the best, because obviously people want to be up and about, but like, I think we gave her the best life that we could have, and I have no regrets about it. Both of so. you are so inspiring. Um, and made a lot of sacrifices. And I don't think a lot of young people would do that. Did you ever waver? Did you ever resent your mom or your grandmother? Because you both had to make a lot of sacrifices. I mean, you're a young man, what, 22 years old, and suddenly you find yourself as your grandmother's primary caregiver. Yeah. It was, I mean, we actually just talked about this backstage. It's, it's really, it's tough to, to put your life on hold as a young person and to, to give your life to somebody else. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it for the world. And obviously there's a lot of ups and downs and there's a lot of dark moments. But I think looking back at the bigger picture and, and seeing all that we've been able to do with my grandmother and all the things that I've been able to learn from my grandmother, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it for a thing. And I think it is difficult for young people to just say, hey, I'm going to put my life on pause. It's time to help out whoever. Um, but uh, yeah, I, would, I wouldn't change it for the world. And I think it's, uh, it's an experience that I'll never forget. And it's a chapter that I'll, I'll, I'll hold close to me. And I think, you know, I'll be learning from that time forever. So what about you, Adrian? Um, well, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Uh, there was a lot of resentment. I mean, like I mentioned, I l had to pick up my life here and just drop everything. I packed up three boxes and shipped them to Florida, something I never thought that I would do. Um, I was a huge traveler, backpacker. Um, my friend and I would take trips every year, had to put that on pause. So yeah, there was resentment. And I think there were many days when I was at m m some of my darkest days of caregiving, I was at my worst. And I resented having to take care of my mom. I was watching all of my friends get married and have kids and do all of these amazing things. And here I was 
caring for my mom and like changing her diaper and bathing her and managing her medications and her care and having to make all of these extremely responsible executive decisions on behalf of my mom. I, I had a lot of resentment. Um, that was at the beginning. And then I had to do a lot of growth and I had to do a complete mindset change around where I was and why this was happening. Because I would always be like, God, why is this happening to me? What did I do in this lifetime to have this happen to me now and not years from now? Like, what did I do? I was a straight A student. Like, I was, I was a good girl. Like, what happened? So I had to do a complete mindset shift. And once I started shifting my mindset and started focusing on the fact that I'm able to help care for my mom and I'm able to have these years with her and I'm able to give her the joy of having her daughter, her best friend by her side through some of the hardest years of her life, that really flipped the script for me. And it wasn't so much resentment, it was more kind of like Chris was saying, for me it was an honor. When my mom was transitioning, I told her, I said, mom, caring for you is and always will be the highest honor of my entire life. Can so. I adopt both of you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously. <laughs> You're amazing and remarkable. Did you ever have a respite though? Like, would you be able to get a break? And I wanted to ask Celia too about, you know, is the cost of hiring professional caregivers so prohibitively expensive for a lot of families that many children or grandsons find themselves in this situation? Yeah, well, I can answer first. I yeah. can speak to that a little bit. So unlike Chris, who was a full-time caregiver, my mom actually lived in an assisted living facility. And we were actually talking about this a bit earlier and it plays into the financial aspect that the only reason that we could afford for my mom to live in an ALF, because costs are astronomical, is that when she was working with our financial advisor, she started a long-term care policy. And if it weren't for that, I would have been in a very different situation. I wouldn't have been able to afford, along with my mom's pension and social security, not only the cost of her living in an assisted living facility, but as her disease progressed, she needed extra full-time aids. So I had to hire other full-time aides. Mind you, I was there every single day from 3 p.m. until I put her in bed seven days a week. But my story would have been very different if my mom hadn't been fortunate enough to make some smart financial choices early on. Yeah. This story really resonates with me. And I think one of the things that Katie said early on is that People are coming from all different walks of life, all different financial situations, and maybe most importantly, different levels of knowledge about how these things might manifest and what kinds of things you can do from a planning perspective. Insurance is one, savings is another, but how many of us don't actually know to think about that or don't know who to ask? Um, I think this is one of the places where you know, banking as an industry, but then also I think there are a lot of resources in the caregiving space that can start to guide people on how, how do you get prepared? How do you think about some of these tools that you might use? Um, and I think you said this earlier, both like you as the person who may need care later on, like what kinds of choices can we make? But then also for those of us who you know have parents who are healthy now, I know one of the things I'm often thinking about is, well, they're healthy today, but how set up are we for what the next five or 10 or 15 years might look like? And are there choices you know I should be making differently to plan for the just in case? Can you talk about, Adrian, your podcast and sure. how it started and how it gave you a lot of comfort and support during this period? Sure. Just as, as Chris's followers have. Yeah. So I always had the idea that I wanted to start a podcast. I Falling into caregiving at a young age, I realized that the younger generation of caregiving, caregivers, excuse me, is such an underserved um, segment of the whole caregiver community. When I fell into caregiving, I didn't even know what the word caregiver was. I didn't self-identify as a caregiver. I self-identified as, oh, I'm, I'm an only child, and this is my mom, and this is what I always thought I was going to have to do for her. So I always knew I wanted to start a podcast. During caregiving, it was just too much. So after my mom passed away, I said, okay, I need to kind of fuel a lot of this energy and time that I have now 
into something to give back to other young caregivers. So the Young Life Interrupted podcast came to be. I released the first episode on the anniversary of my mom's passing as a bit of a tribute to her. And the whole point of the podcast is really to reach young caregivers, to let them know that they're not alone. Like Chris and I were talking earlier, it's a very isolating experience when you fall into caregiving at a young age and you literally think that there's no one in the entire world going through the same thing that you are because your friends aren't going through it, you haven't heard of other people going through it. It's not like when you're a parent and you can turn to your mom friends or your dad friends and you can ask advice. So the podcast really looks to bring different caregivers from all walks of life. So young caregivers caring for a spouse, a parent, a grandparent, a sibling. Um, on the podcast, we have open conversations. And a lot of them are geared towards the topics that we as young caregivers are going through. Because while there are a lot of similar and commonality, similar themes and commonalities among caregivers of all, all ages, when you're caregiving in your 20s and your 30s, you're dealing with a lot of other life milestones and different things that other caregivers can't relate to. You are starting to self-isolate because caregiving takes over. You're losing your friends. You maybe had to put college or your career <coughs> on pause. Dating is obsolete. So the podcast has really just also allowed me to speak to my experiences. It's, it's been very cathartic. I call it my grief journey now that my mom's been passed away I had my caregiving journey, and now I'm on my grief journey. So it's been a really healing and cathartic means to be able to heal and really just to be able to give back to other young caregivers and help them feel seen and heard and like they have a place to come to where they can get information, they can get validation, and just feel a little bit less alone. What kind of feedback and conversations do you have with your followers? Are you hearing from a lot of people in similar situations, Chris? Yeah, I hear from hundreds of people every day. People send me messages saying that they either cared for their grandmother or grandfather, or they're currently taking care of somebody. And it's really nice to see somebody online highlighting the things that they do every day. Because before my videos, they felt like they were the only ones, like I said earlier, on the planet taking care of a loved one. And it get, it's, it's really difficult. And uh, it's just nice to see somebody else doing what you do. That wasn't my plan in the beginning. My plan was in the beginning wasn't to reach out to millions of caregivers and uh, you know be a, be a source of inspiration for people. I was just showing what it is that I was doing on a daily basis and people just seemed to enjoy it. So you know I get, I get feedback from caregivers. I get feedback from younger people too saying that they get inspired to help out their grandfather or grandma or parents when they get older. So it's really nice to get positive feedback. Um, you know, there's a lot of negative feedback too with posting my story online. There's a lot of people saying that I'm only doing, take, I'm only taking care of my grandmother for social media, which I think is the funniest one to hear. Um, because people don't know like what it is that goes on behind closed doors. They only see a minute or two minutes of my life. And, uh, you know, in the beginning, it was really difficult to hear that because it's like, how could you even think that? But now that it's been some time, I can understand if, you random, if you're randomly scrolling on TikTok or Instagram and you see this guy taking care of his grandmother wearing a mic and you think, oh, he only does that when the camera's on. When the camera's off, he's off living his own life. When really, like, I post and I'm still at my grandmother's bedside, like, you know. and People are so cynical. Yeah. <laughs> you know? so, but I've, I've come to realize that that's just how the world is and that's, and that's okay. And I, and I wish those people the best because if they were in the same situation, they would understand what it is that goes on behind closed doors. I'm curious you, about during this, I'm sorry, Celia, do you want to say something? Go ahead. I was, I'm just so impressed that you continue to post anyway. Like yeah. I, I'm not sure I would have the courage to yeah. do what you're doing and yeah. just keep sharing your story. I, I, yeah, I, what you were doing to give care is incredible, but what you do to tell your story in the yeah. face of that negativity is and amazing. I think you're, I think they're so right how lonely and isolating it can be and the internet is the source of a lot of bad things in our society but to be able to build a community be it through a podcast or just online content is a real service I think to others I'm curious about your professional development while you were both Adrian you taking care of your mom Chris drew your your grandmother 
were you, did you have to put all your career aspirations on hold? Were you able to do some kind of professional work so that you would stay at least connected to your hopes and dreams in a way for your own lives? I think I lucked out because my goal was to make videos for a living. So I went to school for visual media and I guess it only makes sense to, you know, document my life and, and make videos for the internet. So, you know, in 2014, it sounds, it, it, it feels weird for me to say, but I've always wanted to be like a YouTuber and like making videos for the internet. And I, I was always fascinated with documenting my life and, and creating little stories here and there. So I think, you know, when I became a caregiver, it was only natural for me to record what it is that I'm going through. And I had no idea that, you know, a lot of people would gravitate to it. And I think it worked out. So I didn't have to necessarily put my professional life on hold. I was able to build that while also, you know, having the responsibility of taking care of my grandmother. That was incredibly serendipitous. <laughs> what, yeah. about, what about you, Adrian, in terms of, you know, what you were planning for your own life? Yeah, so like I said, I, I was, I'm a bit of a free spirit. So I was kind of hopping around into all of these different career fields. I hadn't found a field that I loved and I was like wanting to climb the ranks in. So when I moved back to Florida, um, I had a nine to five job. I didn't love it. Um, another huge challenge that I was starting to face of having a nine to five job in caregiving, it's, it's virtually impossible. Doctor's appointments don't happen at 7 p.m. So it was like taking multiple hours out of the day to take my mom to doctor's appointments when she would end up in the hospital having to take time off work. So for me, I was like, why don't I try to start something virtually where I can work from anywhere? And I started my own project management business, which I was very apprehensive about because I was like, are you crazy? You're going to try to start a small business while you're caring for your mom, like you're out of your mind. But I'm an overachiever and I went for it. And it was one of the best things I could have ever done. I was able to work virtually. So I would take, as long as I had my laptop and a Wi-Fi connection, I said my laptop saw the inside of ERs and hospitals more than most laptops probably did. But it allowed me to continue to build a professional career because what I would always tell myself was that there was going to be a day that my mom was no longer here and I needed something. I needed something that I could continue to grow once she was gone, which so many caregivers don't have that luxury. So many caregivers have to put their life on hold and then when their loved one's gone, they don't even know where to start. They don't know where to turn to because for so many years, they've been out of their social circles. They've been out of their professional circles. So I feel very blessed that it all happened for a reason. And Celia, I imagine that remote working and more flexibility in the workplace is a really helpful development for people who find themselves in these situations. I think both remote work and part-time, like you talked about, and finding just different ways to contribute and, and find a way to do that in a way that helps you grow and develop. And obviously that helps you sustain yourself. We have a world of options now that we didn't have 20 or 30 years ago, which maybe creates some flexibility. I wanted to ask you all about adjusting to life after you lost your mom and your grandmother, because I imagine it's as big an adjust adjustment as it is to becoming a caregiver. Suddenly you find that you no longer have the responsibilities that you were so focused on for so long. Was that a difficult transition, Adrian? It sounds like your small business was really helpful, but just in terms of the emotional toll that took, not only are you grieving someone, your best friend, as you said, but suddenly you're like, wait, my life has changed dramatically. The structure I knew is suddenly gone. Yeah, it was definitely an interesting transition after she passed away. I think having to deal with grief, although I say that I thought I was going to grieve my mom's passing a lot more. But once she passed, I learned about this term called anticipatory grief. And I recognized that I was really grieving her for my entire caregiving journey. So having the grief journey that I was on with the recognition that this person was no longer there. I wasn't going to see her. I wasn't going to be able to touch her, um, to talk to her, even though she never talked back. I mean, I talked her, her ear off, performed Broadway reviews for her in her, you know, in her little apartment. Um, that was huge. I also, at the time she passed, I had a lot of things that were starting to happen. Um, I met my now husband, 
Um, we got engaged. I, I have a stepdaughter that came into my life, and I, and I truly believe my mom wanted to know that I was going to be taken care of, and that's when she decided that she could let go. And so it was very interesting, the transition, because it's like, on the one hand, I was letting go of my best friend and this person who had meant the world to me and did so much for me. And now I was all of a sudden shifting and starting this entirely new life that I had to put on hold for so many years. So it was a really interesting transition. And I know it was all my mom. That makes me so happy, particularly because it's almost Valentine's Day. That's such a, that's such a sweet story. Chris, for you, um, you know, suddenly now you're how old? 30? 30, yeah. 30. And you're like, woo, I can, I can go out and party or whatever it is. I mean, how, how have you adjusted to your new normal? Uh, well, I'm still adjusting, and I think I'll be yeah, adjusting. Yeah, because it was so recent. Yeah, it happened a couple of weeks ago, so I'm still adjusting. And it's interesting that you brought up anticipatory grief or grieving. Uh, I think that makes so much sense to me because at the funeral, I didn't feel, I, of course I was sad, but I didn't feel sadness in the way that other pe people felt sadness at the funeral. I felt more so relief because I've anticipated this day for so long. And now that it's here, I feel, uh, I feel relieved, not only for my grandmother, because she was in so much pain in the last four days of her life, but I feel so much relief for me and my mother who was there for every step of the way. And I think uh, it's just, it, it's, such a, it's such a relieving feeling to know my grandmother can no, is no longer feeling pain and that she doesn't have to, cause she was guilty, you know, in the last eight years, she, she hated people helping her out. She was so independent her entire life. She was a teacher for 20 years. She immigrated here to the Philippines by herself, took all her children with her. And she was such a strong and independent woman for most of her life. And for her to have somebody by her side 24 seven, it was something that she never really got used to. So knowing that she doesn't have to see me every day because she needs help, it's such a relieving feeling. So I'm still in the, you know, in, in this transition. It's funny that you say like, I get to go out and party because that's everybody, that's what everybody assumes. Like, yeah, you get to go out to New York and you don't have to go back whenever you, when Chris you need is to. from Las Vegas, so he doesn't have to come to New York. <laughs> So, but I don't, I, I feel, I don't know, I, I'm still figuring things out, but I do think uh, similar to what you were saying about how your mom kind of set you up. I feel like my grandmother set me up because now I have this really large platform of people who watch my videos. Uh, I, can, I can connect with so many people across the world. And, uh, you know, I, I think I just have so many opportunities in front of me now. And I feel like it's my responsibility to be a good steward of what happens now and all the, whatever happens to me financially, I feel responsible to be a good steward of that and because you know i feel like a fish in a, in a fishbowl sometimes because you know so many people are watching what i do every day i do feel a responsibility to not let people down and and be irresponsible in this transition of my life so, that's great yeah. and it's such a neglected space you know and people need help and guidance and i think you're really filling a need obviously and adrian with your podcast and of course celia with the important financial advice you're giving people. What is the one thing you wish you had known before becoming a caregiver? Oh, man. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wish I would have known that I, it, it's amazing the things that you'll get used to. Because at 21, 22, like a 21 year old is not thinking about changing their grandmother's uh, soiled pads or soiled pampers or thinking about giving his grandmother a shower. But I think it's incredible the things that you can get used to. And I wish I also would have known how fruitful this journey was going to be. I was able to spend so much time with my grandmother and hear stories that I don't think I've ever would have been able to hear if I wasn't by her side. I was able to like have breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the last eight years with my grandmother. And I think it's, it's difficult. I, I feel like I'll, I won't meet a lot of people that, were, that are able to say that. So I think I wish I would have known how fruitful. But also at the same time, if you would have told me that at 22, I don't think I would have believed anybody. So. This young man is an angel. Can I just say, <laughs> like, what? Who are you? <laughs> um, what about you, Adrian? I wish I would have known everything because um, there's so much, like the financial aspect, the social, the emotional, navigating just this crazy healthcare system of ours. Um, that must be very frustrating. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's literally like you feel like you're on this deserted island just trying to figure everything out for yourself. And I wish I would have known to self-identify as a caregiver sooner. I wish I would have understood what a caregiver was and self-identified because I feel like I would have tried to seek out resources much earlier in my journey because resources exist. But unless you know they're out there, you're never going to go looking for them. So I wish I would have known that. Um, I wish I would have known just how hard it was going to be. I think initially I was like, okay, I'm going to take care of my mom. But I think until you're in the depths and the throes of it, and there's good days and bad days, and you're on these crazy like highs, and then these insane lows, and this constant emotional roller coaster, and I say that I developed anxiety, you know, as a byproduct of my care journey. Um, I just wish I would have known how to just work through the highs and lows better. And I wish I would have worked on myself more during that period to help just kind of navigate Take care the of yourself thing. so take you could take of care of your too. mom. Exactly. Yeah. I'm sure that a lot of caregivers neglect their own health and well-being. And that's a really terrible situation because you have to put your own, you know, mask on first before you help somebody else. Is there a specific conversation? Because I think this will be helpful to everyone listening that you wish you had had with your grandmother and your mom before you found, like, so you really truly understood their wishes or do you feel that you understood without that conversation, if you had to go back? I did not know any of my mom's wishes and that put such a weight on my shoulders because by the time I was having to make these massive executive decisions for her, she was not lucid enough to be able to truly communicate. I didn't know if my mom wanted to be buried or cremated. I didn't know if my mom wanted to go in hospice. Like I made the decision to put her in hospice. I made the decision to send her into hospice inpatient in a hospital during COVID in the hope she would get better. My mom maybe would have never wanted to go into a hospital and just would have wanted to stay at home and she died in the hospital. So having those conversations is crucial. I think specifically for us at a younger age, you alluded to it earlier, or I think you did. It's, it's, not, it's not pretty conversations. No one wants to sit around the dinner table and have a conversation about, mom, dad, what are your wishes? What do you want? Um, and I think it's so essential. And that's probably the biggest piece of advice I would give anyone at any age. I mean, I was 29. I didn't even think about having these conversations. I was like, oh, that's fine. My mom's going to live to be in her 80s. We don't have to have these conversations for another 20 years. I think it's really an act of love, actually, to have these conversations. I remember when my dad died and I was walking out of the hospital with my brother and I said, Johnny, and my dad worked in newspapers. And I said, Johnny, we have to write dad's obituary. And he said, oh, Katie, he's already written it. Oh, wow. And I thought that was like such a, there was so much kindness for him to take care of it. So I think you should really look at it as taking care of each other and a part of the process. Do you wish you had had any conversation with your grandmother? I, I, I mean, I, I want to say yes, but I don't even know what we would, what kind of conversation. Sounds like you had, had a lot of conversations. I mean, yeah, we did. None of them had anything to do with me helping her out. Um, <laughs> But uh, I, I think, hope you wrote down those stories, yeah. by yeah, the way. Oh, yeah, there are, a lot of them are recorded. So, oh, good. I'm yeah. so glad. And, you know, and that's another thing. I'll get to your question. But I think an amazing thing about the videos that I made at the funeral, a lot of my cousins were telling me whenever I miss our grandmother, I can well, I can go through your page and I could get a glimpse of how she was in all of her teachings. So I think that's an amazing thing of, you know, documenting life, whether it's on the Internet or not. I think it's important to document your life just just to have something to look back on. But as far as the conversation goes, I mean, I feel I still feel really young now. And at 22, I had no I, I don't I don't even know what we could have discussed back then uh, to make the, the next eight years a lot easier. Uh, you know, it's funny, my, my parents and I joke now, uh, they say, just throw me in a home. And I don't think <laughs> I don't think I could grant their wish of just throwing them in a home and, and just leaving it at that. I know that's, you know, what they wish for. But. Well, maybe they're just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I think when push comes to shove, yeah. they may change their minds. Yeah, maybe. but I don't. Yeah, I don't know what we could have discussed to make it different. I think. I think you know we 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 took it on a day at a time, and I think uh, it was such a huge responsibility that 
I think just going through the motions and figuring it out as I went was the best way for us to go about it. So, so Celia, in closing, what kind of advice would you give? And I guess maybe I'll open it up to everybody, to people listening to this about the future and if they find themselves in a situation of caring for an elderly family member. This is a hard space to give advice, but I think the couple things I feel like I've gotten from this conversation, one is having the conversation, right? Sort of thinking yourself about what you might want for yourself and what you want with your family and being willing to step into that dialogue is is maybe thing one. Should you write it down, by the way? It's because, you know, well, maybe, there, there are all sorts of legal documents, right? What is it called when you have a proxy, power of attorney, et cetera? I mean, you probably should have some, but that's not your area of expertise, I'm, I know. I'm, I'm not a lawyer. Um, I used to be married to one. I'm still, I'm still married to him. He's just not a lawyer anymore. <laughs> it's really important to clarify. <laughs> But there is a lot of advice about going to either a financial advisor or an attorney as you start to kind of think about and plan for these sorts of things. But maybe if I would actually end with just one thing, the idea that the life we live today isn't promised to us. And the life our parents are living or our grandparents or whoever it is that we love, none of it's promised to us. And maybe spending a little bit of time thinking about putting something aside or planning for insurance on the one hand, and then spending time with them yeah. on the other hand. I mean, that's the thing you guys have me thinking about is like, who am I spending time with? And am I putting enough time in the right places? Because that's yeah. that's what I'm taking from your stories. Yeah, I, I always say that some of the, so one of the biggest silver linings in falling into caregiving is I would have never had the time that I had with my mom should it have not been for caregiving. And maybe that that quality time looked very different than what it did before she got sick, but it was still quality time. And I will never regret any of that and having that and just recognizing that no one lives forever, saying I love you, living without regrets, having the conversations before they're too late, I think is incredibly essential as well. And I think preparing for caregiving ahead of time is so important. Like I think of so many things like the hospice, having to make the executive decision to put my mom in hospice. So now here my mom is, I don't know how much longer she has left. If I would have pre-planned and known, okay, when we get to this point, hospice is going to be done. I know who to contact. This is everything involved. It would have alleviated a lot of that emotional stress and burden that I was already experiencing. So preparing to care, I, I say this on my podcast, it's my biggest piece of advice to young caregivers, prepare to care. That's probably one of the biggest things that I would recommend to anyone, any, anyone at any age, no matter who you're caring for, even your spouse. People ask me now, okay, so you went through all this with your mom. Do you have a living will in place? Like, does your husband know your wishes? And it's crazy because I don't have a living will in place. My husband doesn't know my wishes. So it gets you thinking. And I'm going to go back home and have this conversation. <laughs> Not Everyone's on Valentine's going Day. To. <laughs> what about you, Chris? Any advice? Uh, it's tough because I think, uh, like I said earlier, there's nothing that, I, that anybody could have told me at 22 to prepare me for the next eight years of my life. Um, I do think it's important to, to have those important conversations. I'm having them with my parents now of, okay, do you really want to go to a home? Okay, what does that look like? And even then, even when you do have those important conversations, you, it's, it's difficult to prepare for that emotionally. Like you just, you don't know, like people would always ask me, so what's going to happen, you know, when you're no longer a caregiver? I, I would always answer, I have no idea. And I, and it's difficult. I would sit at night and pray and, and, and ask, how, how, how do I prepare for something like that? And I never got an answer because I don't think it's something that you can prepare for. You could have logistics set up, but emotionally, you won't be prepared to see a loved one decline in, in a way that they might. It sounds to me that for both of you, having a community yeah. is really important. And Adrian, maybe it would have been helpful for you to find a community earlier. Because I do think talking to people who are going through similar experiences can be so comforting and make you feel less alone. So whether it's watching videos and being a part of a social media or social platform community, being part of a podcast community, I'm sure there are lots of support groups 
for caregivers. And we were talking before we came on stage that there are a lot of resources. You just have to go out and find them and utilize them. But I would imagine just being able to talk to other people about your experience and bitching to them about, <laughs> you know, this, that, and the other thing, or yeah. it could be really therapeutic. We were um, having a conversation earlier, and it's interesting because Chris was talking about taking on the responsibility of caring for his grandmother. And at first, he almost said burden. I saw like the B, and I was like, you were going to say burden, weren't you? So it's it's interesting because it's only if you've, if you've been through it, like nobody else knows what this is like unless you've been through it. And talking to other caregivers, even talking to Chris, it's so validating. Like you feel seen, you feel heard, you feel less alone. So having that community is so essential. That's why I have the podcast. I started a private Facebook group for young caregivers where it's a safe space to come in, to bitch, to vent about things that are going on and know that everyone in there can 100% relate and understand. It's almost like a huge weight is lifted off of your shoulders. I, I call people that I know, young caregivers, the set of friends that I never thought I would have. Like you have your childhood friends, your mom friends, but I feel like I have these caregiver friends now that will understand me like none of my friends ever will. Well, Chris and Adrian, I have to say it's been a real honor to talk to two such compassionate, selfless people. Thank you both so much. And Celia, thank you so much for your sage wisdom and advice and help in in helping people navigate what can be a very trying situation emotionally, financially, and in sort of all ways. So I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for being on Next Question. You guys were awesome. Thank you. Thank you.